So, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, thank you very much to be with us. My name is Kostas, I, and uh, together with the, uh, my colleague George and George, uh, we would like to welcome you to one more Athena talk. The purposes of the seminars is like to disseminate and try to conduct various disciplines in research and also to inform you about developments regarding the research topics that our network and our colleagues all over the world uh, they are doing and we are very proud of them as well. Uh, today we are very happy, we are you know, doubly happy because we have one of the Athenians, you know, we have uh, Professor Rebecca Diaz uh, Retonto uh, from the University of Vigo, she's an engineer. Uh, from uh, her field is like computer science. I will speak a little bit about uh, uh, Rebecca, that she's a full professor at the Telematics Engineering Department, the University of Vigo in Spain, and she leads the Information and Computing Lab. So, you know, thank you very much, Rebecca, for this. A research group affiliated with the Atlantic Research Center. Very interesting as well. In the last decade, her research area uh, has focused on applying artificial intelligence and solutions in distributed and coordinated networks of devices. Her current work faces the definition of efficient information sharing protocols among peer devices to avoid overhead in communications and uh, computation in the field of federated learning. This approach must be aligned with the privacy and security aware designs to balance efficiency, privacy, security, and utility. So her work, uh, she has published eight indexes, indexed scientific journals. Um, she has uh, led more than 10 research projects in the last 10 years. Uh, since 2015, and this is very important, and I congratulate you, Rebecca, she had co-advised 13 PhD theses, four of them funded by EU grants, two of them funded by FBI and FPU programs. And she's currently advising seven doctoral students uh, with the doc, uh, doctoral program at Vigo. So this is a doctoral school, I suspect. So Rebecca, once again, thank you very much for your time and your contribution. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. OK, thanks so much, Constance. Um, I'm going to, to talk to you about uh, a little bit, just uh, the, the big picture of federated learning and the trade-off that we need to to get between utility, security, and privacy. And just to start, I'm going to define it, which is the problem, right? Uh, usually, before the federated learning approach, we usually have a cloud computing center approach. In this case, as you can see in this picture, uh, the devices, the user devices or corporate devices, uh, are in possession of the data. And this data is shared, that means it's sent through the connections to a big data center. This big data center is the one that includes all the data and process the data to obtain some algorithm to treat the information, okay? Uh, this has uh, several problems. Some of them are related to the efficiency, I mean. If um, I need to have an answer, quick answer in the user one or in the user two, for instance, the time I need to spend sending the request to the cloud computing server and receiving the answer to the local uh, user uh, device again could be uh, important. And so this is a, a drawback, right? But the most important in, in this talk I'm, I'm trying to, to, to show you is the problems with security and privacy. This data usually maintains or stores sensitive information. The, ones, the, the moment we share this data and send it through the network, it uh, could be attacked, could be damaged, could be uh, appropriate by someone, right? So according to this, uh, the next, we, I, I'm going to show you, this is just, uh, just a short picture. Short picture. Uh, this is uh, quite important, especially in health areas. This is the one in everybody can understand this, right? Uh, if these users, one, two, three, four, could be hospitals that maintain our data, that means our uh, health uh, users, our diseases, uh, our diagnostics uh, uh, tests, you see. And someone is going to tell, uh, tell us that this private data is going to be shared, this could be a problem, right? 
So instead of using this centralized approach, the, the next uh, uh, philosophy is doing something totally different, which is uh, called federated learning. In federated learning, this is what you have in, on the right in this picture, the philosophy is quite different. Here, the users, yeah, you can see, maintain their own data. The data is not moved. The data is at the hospitals or the data is in my mobile phone. Nothing goes out from here. What I'm going to share with the global or the central area, the manager here, which is in a data center, for instance, is not my data, is my model. What's the model? The model is the algorithm, the parameters of the algorithm that obtains some result. For instance, if we see, we, we are going to say that the user one is one hospital, and here the data is the diagnosis images for, I don't know, x-rays, for instance. And using one algorithm here, this hospital is able to uh, decide if uh, some pictures something in the picture, something in the x-ray could be uh, lungs, lung cancer, let's say, okay? So this hospital is not going to share, no the diagnostic, uh, diagnostic images, not the data of the users, the patients. What is going to share is just the parameters of this algorithm, right? So these parameters go here and travel through the network and this data center receive these parameters from many different hospitals, for instance. And what is going to be done here? Here, these models are merged, are combined to obtain and to know, obtain a better intelligence, a better algorithm, obtaining new parameters. And these new parameters are going back to the users. In this way, user one is going to learn about the information that user two knows, but without accessing this data. This in the example of the health systems is, I guess, is quite um, easy to see. Let's say this is a hospital, a community hospital. This is a specialized in cancer treatment. This is another hospital center. Each one of them obtain the local model, their algorithm to detect some disease. Here, what is shared is not this private data, it's just the parameters of this local model. This server combines all the parameters and go back to them with the knowledge of all of them. In this way, this hospital, this community hospital that uh, attend many different kinds of disease can learn about lung cancer from this without affecting this private data, right? So this is an approach that could be quite interesting to not moving the private information, not moving the sensitive information, and in such a way, try to protect the information of the users, right? And in this case, the interest also from the hospitals in this case of use. So what's the deal, right? It seems that everything is arranged and solved, but the problems are not as easy as uh, I summarized, right? So uh, we are going. To, I'm going to try to show you that there are open uh, challenge here that uh, indeed uh, the uh, scientific community is researching. I'm going to organize the information into three different points. The first is regarding the privacy, the second regarding the security, and the third regarding the performance of the algorithm, I mean the utility of the system, right? So we'll start with the privacy. Well, I said that uh, the data is not shared. This could be understood that uh, our data is protected and so everything is okay. However, the models in some way are summarizing all the data. So this summary is the one which is transport or exchange through the network. And here there are some problems regarding to applying like reverse engineering. I mean, I start to analyze the model and I'm going to try to infer private information, private information, sensitive information from the users. Uh, 
In the in the slide, you can see here like two big sets. The gradient is using some uh, uh, artificial intelligence algorithm in many of them. And the others are models in general, right? But the both things are the same. The idea is I cannot access the private data, but I access the summary of this data, which is in some way stored in the model. The model is the one which is shared. So analyzing the model, I can try to infer information from the users. So what kind of things we can do to avoid this to happen, right? What kind of solutions we can apply? Mainly there are like three, um, like three alternatives, just uh, the big picture, right? Three main options. One of them is applying differential privacy. The idea with differential privacy is, mm, okay, instead of analyzing all the data, my data, I'm going to blur a little bit the data. So instead of saying to you that I am a woman and my age is 50, I'm going to say to you that I am a woman, but my age is between, I don't know, 45 and 55. 55, right? So the data in some way is manipulated to share some private information, right? How this works? The idea is the following one. If I have a bulk data set, a massive data set, the information of one parameter, of one patient, of one person is not relevant in the whole data set, right? So what the, the philosophy is disguising a little bit parts of the data to obtain on the whole the global behavior, the simil similar behavior, enough to process in the algorithms, right? So this is reflected here in the slide, like adding a noise. A noise is something that is disturbing, right? So it's like adding a noise in the data to disturb a little bit the original data in such a way you cannot infer exactly sensitive information, but you can use the whole information for your objective. In this case, for instance, detecting the lung cancer is the example I used before. As you can see in the slide here, uh, we have an important decision to, to take, right? You can see in this uh, graphic that the utility of the data, that means the precision of the algorithm is affected by the noise I have added. The higher the noise, the less utility, the less precision I have. So I have here low utility, low privacy, and here is the acceptable trade-off in this um, blue point here, right? So these orange are not exactly good because in the first one, in the low utility, I have a lot of privacy, but the information is not going to be useful for me. Here I have a low privacy. The information is going to be very precise. The algorithm is going to be very accurate. It's going to calculate things, things very good, but the cost is so important for me, for the users or for the companies. So the thing is trying to obtain an acceptable trade-off. The second option to avoid this problem, remember the problem is that people uh, not with, with uh, good intentions, can infer private information from the models, right? So the first one is trying to disguise a little bit the data. The second one is applying some kind of encryption. It's called homomorphic encryption. The idea here is, okay, you need or you want to analyze my data, that's perfect. I want you to analyze it because then you're going to give me an important feedback, but I don't going to share to you my data plain and clear, I'm going to encrypt my data. So the thing here is the algorithms has to be able to work with encrypted data. So here is not a little disguise like with the differential privacy. Here is an encryption. So I use a key and I encrypt this. 
but the algorithm is able to process this encrypted data. The, the process is similar to the one you have here, right? On the top, in the first, on the first, uh, the top part, here you have a hospital with if patient information. This patient information, we could be age, uh, diseases, diagnostical pro uh, proofs, whatever, uh, tests, are encrypted. And this is the one, this is the information with this share, this encrypted data. Here, with this homomorphic computation, the algorithm is able to work with the encrypted data, returns the solution or the diagnosis, for instance, and here I can, using another key, to decrypt his, right? So in the first case, in the uh, differential privacy, I disguise a little bit the data, but the data is plain, is clear, no encrypted. Here, this is a strongest step. I encrypt the data. So if you want to know what my data is, you need to have the key, the private key. So this is a problem of maintaining the key private, right? But it is, it's quite good for this kind of things. Perhaps you can see this better in this slide or in this example, right? Here, this uh, the on on the right, you have different uh, devices. Each device has the data in this blue part, and this data is clear without being encrypted. But to work with the homomorphic encryption, encrypts this data set, encrypts this model and share the results to the others encrypted, okay? So this is the second philosophy I told you about my trying to maintain the privacy. And the third one is dividing the computation among different elements. It's what is called secure multi-party computation. This means we are going to create some methods in such a way that uh, each part so each user takes only part of the data and analyzing part of the data and sharing the result, all of them can obtain the final information. In this slide, you can see uh, here. In this slide, you can see an example of addition. It's a simple example, right? It's not uh, an example of uh, co complex in, uh, artificial intelligence algorithm rhythms. In this case, you can see on the, on your left, on your left, that we have uh, three users. One is blue, the other is like orange or red, and the third one is uh, green. The idea is each one of them uh, has a data which uh, is going to keep private. In the yellow case is the number 40. In the um, red case is number 60. In the green case is number 80, right? They don't want to share this number with the others. So what they're going to do, they are going to divide this number randomly into three factors in such a way that the addition of these three is just the original number, right? So in the blue case, the result is, for instance, minus 66 plus 38 plus 68. And what is going to do this yellow part or this yellow uh, element is going to share no the three of them, only two, the first one and the second, for instance. And this procedure is repeated in the others. The red one divided the 60 into three different numbers in such a way the addition of the three is just 60 and only share two of the numbers, 62 and 18 with the other two. And the green one do the same thing. After that, when each one of the elements receive the share information of the others, do the addition and do this uh, summation, right? And this summation is the one that is shared among the three of them. And if you do the summation of this data, you are going to obtain the final number, this 180. So 180 was the objective. The three of them would like to know the addition of the three numbers, but without sharing 
the original number, right? This is a, a, an example, it's like a toy example, right? But this is the philosophy behind the secure multi-party computation. The idea is divide the operation and share only part of the data. So for these private things, we have seen three options or three strategies. In the first one, uh, differential privacy, I blurred a little bit, I distort a little bit the data. In the second one, the encryption, I encrypt totally the data. And in the third one, the secure multi-party computation, I share only part of the data, right? However, even we apply some of these three strategies or even a combination of these three strategies, we have also some issues in security in these federated learning schemes. What kind of uh, problems we can have here? In security information, in security we, we part or we start from the fact that, that something could be um, inappropriate, I mean, could be um, an attack, right? Some of the elements in the federated network, some of the users is not uh, totally right. I mean, is doing to interfere in the behavior of the whole learning, federated learning approach, right? And here we differentiate between mainly two kinds of attacks. One of them is called the Byzantine attacks. I mean, so, so some of the elements with intention or without intention start to behave uh, wrongly, right? In the second civil attacks is totally an intention. And so um, we replicate elements in the network and these elements are fake elements, fake users that are working in the network seeming to be okay, seeming to be trusted, but in fact, they are not. And what kind of uh, attacks could be, can be done here? One of them is uh, what is called data poisoning. Data poisoning means I interfere with the data, I alter the data. So you're, when you are learning in the training process, you are learning from wrong data. So the results are going to be wrong, right? And the other is trying to attack the parameters, attack the model. I distort the model, right? This can be done by the own elements in the federated learning scheme or by external sources that interfere in the communication. Remember that we are going to share the model and the model travels through the network. So could be someone, some element in between in the communication that interfere and change the model that do an attack of this way, right? Or another one is someone attacking one of the nodes. So external attack that interfere in one of the nodes and change internally the data of the model, right? So what kind of things we can do here? Uh, how, how we are going to try to, to trust in the receive information to merge the models. This is something that is uh, quite complicated already. It's not easy to detect the malicious or the infected data. We can do several approaches, several different things, right? One of them is trying to compare the updates, I mean the models that the, the elements are sending. If the model that one hospital sends now and the model that the hospital sends tomorrow or next week are very, very different, something could be wrong, right? Suddenly the diagnosis don't change from one day to another. So this could be uh, um, a, a evidence of uh, something is changing, something is going wrong. So it could be uh, an evidence of uh, some kind of attack. At least it deserves to be it deserves to be analyzed, right? This is one of the things that uh, we can do to protect us, ourselves. And when when I'm talking about ourselves, I'm talking about the 
complete network, right? So compare the information that you are sending me today to the information you are sending me tomorrow and the information you are sending me the next day. Could be if something changes a lot, could be uh, intuitively something that I need to analyze. Could be an evidence of an attack, right? Even the distance could be not only in the, the contribution of the same element. I mean, not the information that the same hospital is sending me today, tomorrow, and the day after that, but different hospitals, right? This is something to be analyzed. Performance. Hmm. Performance is another parameter that we can analyze to, to check if an attack is being is happening or not, right? Uh, if my algorithm is working properly and suddenly starts to go wrongly, I need to, to, to check, right? The accuracy variates. So one of the things that can be done is testing the information you are sending me over my data set that I know that is clean because I'm checking this. This is an extra step and needs a lot of uh, computation and resources, right? Because it's an extra step that I need to do each time the update or the model is shared. And finally, another technique is trying to analyze the statistics. I mean, uh, when I focusing on a special problem, specialized problem, like the one I told you at the beginning with the detection of the lung cancer, for instance, the, the X-rays don't have a lot of variations. I mean, <laughs> the shape is the, the lung and we have different, of course, different different images, but there are not uh, suddenly a lot of parameters that, that change, right? So analyzing the statistics of the data is something that could be is something uh, uh, can, we can detect an outlier here. And so if an outlier produ is, is produced, we need to analyze deeper if something is going wrong, right? Uh, in, I, I would like just to uh, do a, like a short, um, mention here about one of uh, the things that we are working on this, right? Because I told you in the previous slide about the distance, the performance, the statistic, but there is also another other mechanisms that we can use uh, to try to uh, warranty the origin of the data and the no manipulation of the data. Is this this kind of uh, blockchain technologies like blockchain, this kind of technologies like blockchain, sorry. So uh, we are working here in my team in, in Vigo, uh, trying to apply this kind of uh, blockchain elements in the elements of the federated learning in such a way that um, we can guarantee that the data has not been manipulated, right? So the, the attack, the, pro the probability of having an attack is being reduced. Hmm? Here you have a, a scheme, it's probably is too technical, but the idea here is that each one of these vertical things represent a node, in our example, a hospital, for instance. And here we have a, a blockchain technology that received information and this information cannot be manipulated without notice, right? And finally, because I told you about privacy, security, and finally the performance or the utility, right? Because we do all of this because we pretend to obtain an objective. And the objective is in our uh, example, the one I introduced at the beginning is detection of lung cancer, right? So this is the utility. I do all this uh, work, all the, I invest all these resources because at the end, I'm going to receive a diagnosis. If your X-ray is okay, or could be, could be a small evidence of that you need more more studies because it could be starting lung cancer, right? So the performance, the utility, this can be affected also in in a federated learning scheme. 
and could be affected because of different factors, right? One of them is because the nodes, the elements that are participating and training their own data are heterogeneous, right? Could be different elements with different computation, different hardware and software systems, more efficient or less efficient. And so they are going to need more time or less time to be able to process all the local data, that, right? Then the networks and the availability. I told you at the beginning that we need to exchange these models. They need to travel throughout the network, but the network could be a very quick and well-connected network, or could be depending on the interferences and the connection I have in my device. If I'm talking about my mobile phone, probably depending on the area I'm, I'm right now, are you going to have more connection or better connection or worse, right? This entails also the mobility. There are elements that could be going and moving, right? So these time requirements are quite important if we are talking about not exactly the hospital example, but we are, uh -huh. we are talking in internet of things environments. And in this slide, you can see IOT like the 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 from Internet of Things, right? And I IOT from industrial IOT. In industry, uh, we have some very automatic uh, environments sensorized with a lot of devices that maybe could be in the move on the move. Sorry. So receiving the information from these devices depends on the connection, on the availability, even on the battery, <laughs> if you have battery enough in the device or not. So there are a lot of elements here that are not, uh, that could be interfere in the performance. Hmm? So what kind of solutions we have here um, depend, depend mainly on the application, right? But one of the things that are uh, is tendency is, is the tendency, in my opinion, in this research area is trying to decentralize the learning. In the federated learning, at the in the, the slide I showed you at the beginning, we have like a central element and other elements that work for them. So there are workers and a central intelligence or data data center, right? In decentralized learning, we don't have that scheme. There is not a boss, there's not a master. The elements share among them all the information, as you can see in this example. In this example, you can see that there are mobile phones, but instead of mobile phone, could be any other computation element. It could be a, a computer, it could be um, uh, the smartwatch, could be any element that is able to collect data and process data, right? So these elements share among them, like uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer scheme or system, the information. So they receive information from their peers and they receive information from the peers, from the other elements in this network, depending on the connection they have, depending on the availability of this, right? This is quite important in IoT. And in this case, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce you a different uh, kind of uh, intelligent or algorithm, right? Usually when we are talking about uh, artificial intelligence, complex artificial intelligence algorithm, we talk about uh, this uh, kind of model I have here, right? So I invest a lot of time in building my model obtaining my model and then if I can if I don't retrain or update the model, the model is not going to be able to manage the, the changes, right? In this case, uh, this is a different philosophy which is called incremental learning. And incremental learning, the idea is the data is included into the algorithm. And each time I receive new data, the algorithm is training and retraining itself. In this case, we are able to manage the context in a good way. So combining the incremental learning with the decentralized learning is a very good option to manage 
this uh, learning in uh, moving systems or in IoT, I IoT systems. This is what we have here, right? This is another uh, thing in which we are working here in Vigo. And you can see in this slide, each one of these call nodes represent an element that could be a sensor, could be a mobile phone, could be any computation element. And these elements receive their own data, right? And this data is processed, processed it locally. And then we share among all the devices with uh, the centralized scheme, only the mobile. And we are doing incremental learning in each one of these nodes. This is something that is quite interesting, especially in IoT systems, right? Because usually these devices are not have, have not a lot of capability or computation capability. So what which are the challenges here? Reduce the overhead in the computation, in the communication, that means not exchange a lot of information if it's not needed. Not, not use complex uh, algorithm if it's not needed. Try to protect against cyber attacks and try to protect the sensitive data. So these four elements are the four pillars for this uh, research area and they're the challenges that uh, people working in this area is trying to solve. And I guess, Constantinos, that uh, I adjust to my time. Is that OK? So we have enough time for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. Muchas gracias, as you say, in your country. It Thank was you. very clear, at least for me. Uh, so I would like to provide the floor, if you can stop sharing the, the screen, uh, Rebecca. Yeah. Uh, to the audience. Otherwise, I will start the discussion. I have some questions. So I, I will count to one, two, three, one, two, three. So I will start the discussion. Uh, so my first, you know, like I would like to link this also to Satis representation before two, three weeks. I would like, you know, the, my first question is the following. What is the, the ratio of impact of the law and of the technology? regarding the handling of data because you may you make a, you know a very nice diagram I, I, utility and privacy and you have an ideal point but i would say you mentioned only from the technology point of view but we have also the law aspect of the same uh, 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 topic so what is the, who is more important and how technology advises law and how law advises technology development this is my first question this is a very difficult question. <laughs> uh, I thought that it was the easier one. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, 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 it's true. Um, okay, one of the, at the beginning of the federated learning scheme, one of the um, things that, um, what's the saying in English, like uh, boost the federated learning scheme was precisely the legal issues. Uh, this federated learning scheme uh, is working, or the, the main example is the health industry. And in the health industry, uh, the sensitive data is really has to be very well protected. And the legal issues started prob probably here, right? So using this federation is like the federation in, the, in politics, right? So I have different hospitals from different companies. The companies, they are not sharing the data because, the legal, because of the legal issues as well. So with these federated uh, agreements, they share just a summary of the data. So in this case, the legal aspects, in some point they boosted the starting of this federated learning scheme. Apart from that, from the technological point of view, it's also a good thing to, to do, right? So what is uh, your question? The second question was, it was is the, the, you know, the I mean, waiter, which yeah, is more yeah. important, right? Legal or technology? Uh, both of them, I will say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say that depend on the region you live. In if you live in Europe, Europe uh, ah. legal aspects are very important. And so privacy <laughs> and data of the users are really well protected. 
if you live in other countries with other kind of legal uh, environments, the data of the users are not as important, at least from the government point of view. And so they can be used for the global community. Mm -hmm. The government says uh, for the benefit of everybody, I don't know, uh, you, you could ask to the, to the persons <laughs> individually. So the region in which you live totally define the use of the data. Uh, Stratis, your opinion as a lawyer from technology point of view? I, I I guess that you have a point. Yeah. Yes. Oh well, uh, I I find uh, the project of Professor Diaz fascinating, and I paid a lot of of attention, and I will follow on their outputs, uh, as there are many things to discuss. But if I could only ask one question, so I was seeing this diagram on the uh you know this optimization of the trade offs. And I was wondering, um, what do you consider in the privacy side? Is it only a matter of uh, statistical disclosure or is it also uh, qualitative uh, parameters? Let's say if uh, it is a research center or that, ha that processes HIV positive uh, like uh, patients and the research center on nutrition, which only has uh, dietary uh, yeah, data. Do you think we should do a change in the trade-off or, yeah. The thing is defined by the cost, the cost of the privacy. So the, the function that you need to define is the cost of the privacy. And the cost of the privacy is not only depending on the statistic aspects, as you said. Um, it's not only the cost of um, disguising the data, right, or hiding the data. It's the cost depending on the application field, as you really uh, very well pointed out. It's not the same. The cost of privacy, if I'm talking about health, that if I'm talking about, I don't know, fashion or any other um Probably if there's someone here working in fashion is going to tell me that I don't have any idea. This is the example I use. But I mean, in health, even in health, yeah. you uh, have talked about two very different issues, AIDS and nutrition, right? Both of them are sensitive. By <laughs> leaking information in one aspect or in another, it has different consequences. So these consequences only define, also, sorry, also define the privacy cost. And they have to be defined in such a way. So the privacy cost is higher depending on the application field. And this is, has to be taken into account, right? So it's a combination of uh, technical, technological and statistic aspects and also the application field that also determinate the, uh, determine in some way the technology that you're using, right? Uh, in my presentation, I told you about uh, encrypting the data or disguising a little bit the data. So in demography, in the US, they disguise a little bit the data. But in a hospital talking about AIDS, you need to encrypt the data, right? So the kind of technology is also determined uh, by, the, by the application field. Rebecca, you know, on to, I, I don't know, Stratis, uh, do you have a continuation? Uh, Manolis, uh, may you know, I ask something? Sure, you know, Costa, Rebecca? yes, because I have Thank a different you. question. Yeah. Uh, my, Rebecca, tell, let me let me tell you that my my colleague uh, Manolis Maravelakis used to work in fashion. When he was young, he was a model. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, hi Tatiana. Uh, I would like to ask you something, Rebecca, particularly regarding the medicine. I mean, all the efforts and the and medicine, the medical science was the let's say the lighthouse of this effort is like to move to personalized medicine, and personalized medicine. You know, request the info, any information. You cannot encrypt anything. So how the how, how the medicine and technology deals this? I mean, to me as a naive, because I have no uh, knowledge about your topic. You know, I'm just hearing a lot of you know lectures and talks. Uh, how is it looks to me a little bit contradictory? How you know you are going to serve personalized medicine when we should you know have a high privacy, uh, now I'm talking about utility now we come, how are we going to move ahead on this? And this is very important because this model now 
tries to be applied in personalized education as well. A very fast comment in order to give the floor to Anolis. Uh, okay. Um, when you try to manage privacy with utility, you, you come to this kind of uh, discussions, right? However, uh, medicine, as you know, works on statistics a lot, a lot. When you go to the doctor with your symptoms, the doctor is going to tell you, the according to the symptoms, the, the, the most probable thing that you have, right? Only if you came back because that haven't been solved is going to do deeper uh, deeper analysis, and in this is going to be the same. I mean, uh, to take uh, the risk of me having uh, lung cancer, let's say, right? You don't need exactly to know my address. You don't need exactly to know my uh, age. You don't need exactly to know the city or the name of the city uh, I live, right? You need to know that my range of age is. Um, middle-aged woman, they say, uh, that I live in a middle-sized uh, city with uh, industrial city, so it's going to infer in the pollution. Uh, you, only, you don't need exactly how many hours or what kind of a sport I, I do. You only need if I sport something or nothing, or nothing. And with that data, you have a stereotype. This is the first approach. This is going to give you, uh, it's going to give you not a very accurate probability, but a good probability, like the similar to the doctor is going to tell you when you go to the first session there, right? Then if you need something more, yeah, you need to feed the algorithm with more information. And probably you are going to need to detail a little bit more. So this is going to be in iterations, right? Is the useful mm -hmm. thing to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you very much. The floor is to Manolis. Manolis. Uh, Rebecca, thank you very much for your presentation. I, le I learned a lot of new things today. So I have a more general question. Uh, how, how about uh, social media? I was uh, I was looking on the news uh, last days. There is Zuderberg and uh, representative from TikTok and LinkedIn, I think Instagram. And now they're being accused that uh, this social media are a bad influence for young children. So my question is, uh, what about federated learning? Can it be applied or is it applied to social media? And uh, what's your expert opinion about uh, social media and uh, security and privacy? Yeah, the problem with the social media is that the algorithms are feeding themselves. And so uh, if uh, you are interested in something, they tend to offer more information about that. Then uh, don't... Mm, don't forget that in social media, they live from publicity. So they need to in, include content that is going to be um, quickly clicked, right? And this influence with the teenagers and the mental health is something that they are accused for because the, it seems to be that the, the companies already knew about, about this, this pernicious influence, right? Uh, what kind of things we can do or if federated is applied already in this kind of things? Yeah, federated learning is applied already in the social media. The algorithm is not the same algorithm for everybody. Okay, it's the same algorithm, I mean. But your device has your own uh, clicks. And according to your own clicks and combining with the clicks that your the stereotype to, to whom to which you you belong is going to offer you the content. I mean, it's something similar I told before with the with the diagnosis in, in health that Constantinos asked. Uh, you don't need exactly, exactly all my data, but I belong to a stereotype. I belong to a collective. And according to the collective, this is the, the, the core of the algorithm, right? It's going to recommend you some things. And then these things are refined within your device with your own things, right? So this federated learning is already working. Your mobile phone is sending what kind of things are you keen on, right? And even if you don't share your data, exactly my name, my age, my position, you are in a stereotype. And the algorithm feeds from the stereotypes, from different um, inputs from the same stereotype to create the new recommendation. So one of the things is that is tend to be um, the, the what's the, the word here in English is um, 
Say it in español. Uh, sí. <laughs> es endogámico. Endogamic? Endogámico. Okay. Yeah, it's a Greek word. It's a Greek word. Endogámico. Existing English endogamic? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah. So it's something that uh, uh, like Greeks... feeds from the self and yeah, is yeah, always yeah. coming back on the same thing, right? So it's like uh, uh, isolation. In the case of the teenagers, it's uh, even, even much worse. Uh, we need to wait for the result of the trial and the, all the evidences, but um, it seems that uh, they feed with uh, not healthy content to teenagers that uh, had a tendency to to see this kind of content. So it's uh, another problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And You're the welcome. floor to Tatiana for the final question. Thank you, Costas. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, I like your presentation very much. I missed the start because of a meeting, uh, but I'm so sorry that two of my colleagues from my group, um, we are officially the database technology lab from the University of Maribor Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. But a big part of the group, including me, myself, partially, we are dealing with uh, cybersecurity as well as privacy. Um, so uh, I'm sorry that my colleagues dealing with privacy and cryptography, uh, they are at the moment on holidays, lucky there. But uh, I will share with them the, the link that and for the, to the uh, record of your talk. Uh, and might be there will be a possibility to contact you and to see if there is more overlapping with our group. Uh, personal, I will be next week uh, on Wednesday and Thursday in Vigo. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't know if there would be any possibility to meet, but might be... I can send an email to you and we will see what is uh, uh, possible because we have a kickoff meeting for some uh, uh, project. And uh, yeah, uh, it was my pleasure. And uh, I hope that this is a possibility to, to some uh, uh, connection and maybe even some further cooperation in the future. Yeah, of course, my email is on the presentation and Konstantinos may share with you my email and if you are here next week yeah for sure we can find uh we can find a slot to 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 meet in person together yeah of course yeah Very i will interesting. Thank that you. manuel it's from your school uh, the... manuel we have a lot of manuels manuel uh... manuel fernandez iglesias maybe I know English as a singer myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, we have a lot of Manuels. It's they, a very popular they can, name. Uh, uh, they can project at the moment. Uh, I just lost uh, because it's um, yeah many, and then I'm losing also uh, the names. Uh, 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 no, we, no problem. If you write me an email and you are going to be in my school, uh, of course, we are uh, going to, to have Manuel, time to, to see you. Uh, Cairo Rodriguez. Ah, Cairo. Yeah, best. <laughs> the lot of, yeah, Cairo. Yeah, he's a colleague of mine. In fact, we work in, not in this case, in this uh, area, we work in bots <laughs> together yeah, in I some was, projects. I was expecting uh, somehow. Okay, so, great. So, uh, yeah, of I will course. Contact if you, you. If you are come here, uh, I'll, I'll ask Manuel and we can have a coffee or whatever and have time to to work, to talk together. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Great. Excellent. So this is another application of Athena Talks. It works like a doodle. You can set up <laughs> meetings. <laughs> well, Great. I, I, we have to close because we have a other kind of series of meetings and activities. I would like to thank all of you uh, for your participation, particularly for Rebecca from the discussions that follow Rebecca's uh, presentation, uh, you can see the impact and the information uh, that have reached the, the audience. So Rebecca, thank you again. And uh, thank you all of you for your participation. Uh, take care. Thank you. Uh, thank you for nice the invitation. Meeting. Nice to meet you. Anytime, anytime. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.
Bye. Bye, Tatiana.